reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the Gospel of Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, Jesus' wisdom. We're going to talk about wisdom today. Uh, Proverbs talks about the fact that uh, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And if you want a good definition of what wisdom is, wisdom is learning how to live life skillfully. What's it all about, Alfie? Remember that movie? (laughs) What's life all about? And I think the older we get, the more confused we get, uh, unless you know Jesus. Uh, I have now, at my stage of life, come down to realize that life is basically all summarized in that one word, Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And uh, we're going to talk about the words of Jesus today as he expresses wisdom in showing us what's really important in life. He's going to give wisdom and wise counsel to 70 of the uh, people going out as disciples to minister. He'll give them specific instructions for their ministry. He'll also give them specific warnings about those who are going to reject Jesus. And remember, when you go out and get a rejection, it's not a rejection of you. It's a rejection of Jesus. That's in the first 16 verses. Then he's going to wisely direct the disciples who are so excited about their victory over demons. He's going to redirect their joy not towards demonic deliverance, but towards eternal life, eternal salvation. And then he's going to talk about his own joy at their salvation. That's verses 17 to 24. Then he's going to talk about teaching uh, to love one's neighbor verses 25 to 37, and then finally, most importantly, to love God, the love for God, verses 38 to 42. I think Paul summarized it well in Colossians chapter 3. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. My two favorite words in prayer, as I get older, my prayers get shorter and shorter. My favorite prayer Almost all day long, whenever there's a question, wisdom, Lord, that's all we need. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this chance to look at wisdom, wisdom that comes from Jesus and that's all about Jesus. We love you, Lord. Wisdom, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 10 of Luke, let's talk first of all about commissioning the 70. Remember, he had already commissioned the 12. And now the 70, and he's commissioning us here today as well. He's going to talk about specific instructions, verses 1 to 12, and then specific warnings, verses 13 to 16. Let's look at those instructions. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. He broke them down two by two. What's the advantage of two? A lot of advantages. And when you go alone, you're more vulnerable, you're more lonely, you're more susceptible. Uh, when you've got somebody else there with you, that other person can give you strength. The Bible says that one in prayer can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. One can balance the other. We don't see everything the same way. We don't see the whole scene, but another person with us can give us a little balance. We also get off the track. Somebody can pull us back as well. We get misunderstood and we get accused falsely. That extra person can be a good witness on our behalf. Or if we get off track, that person can say, come on, get your eyes back on Jesus. Uh, Most of all, just fellowship. 
two by two. That's why it's good when you go someplace, go with somebody else. Take another person with you, and uh, you'll find it's very, very biblical and a great blessing. So he's about to move out and to the outlying areas and share the gospel, but he sends these folks out as forerunners, even as John the Baptist was a forerunner. Today, Jesus wants to reach this area, the darkest area in the country, as we know, from the Gallup report and the Barna report, Albany, Schenectady, and Troy is the last area, the least spiritual, least Bible-read, church-going area in the whole United States. You and I are forerunners. When you go to work, when you go to school, when you go to the grocery store, you are a representative of Jesus Christ. And you know when you're going out the kind of reception you're getting. In the Albany, Schenectady, and Troy area, I can go into a grocery store or a gas station or what have you, and I can say, praise the Lord. And that's what I get for response. Huh? Thank you, Jesus. Huh? Now, down south, you just sneeze and they say, God bless you. You've got a revival. You've got 25 people there praising the Lord. But up here, it's as dead as can be. But you and I are forerunners. Keep saying praise the Lord. Keep saying thank you, Jesus. Break up that fallow ground. When you and I pray, that's breaking up that fallow ground. I was trained in the military to be a, a forward observer uh, with the air, uh, with, with a, uh, a Nike Hercules uh, missile battalion later on, but my first job was with a 105 millimeter howitzers. I was trained in that, you know, those, those uh, guns that shoot off in the area. And I was trained to be a forward observer, which was considered to be the shortest life expectancy in the army. You had to go way, way out in front of your group here among the enemy with your binoculars. You had to visualize, see where they were, and then you had to radio back to the howitzers, send the, uh, send the rockets, send the missiles into this area, and they started coming in. You had to say, go to the right 50 meters, to the left, what have you. And in some sad cases, some of the guys had to, when they were surrounded, they had to call in their own location, send the missiles, and kill them and us as well. Well, the point is, that forward observer there is directing those missiles against the enemy. The enemy can't see those howitzers, can't even see the forward observer most of the time, but suddenly they're getting rocketed. That's the way it is with our prayers. You know, you, know, you talk to your relatives. I've got relatives who say, do not talk about Jesus anymore. I've got a sister who has said that several times. She was here a couple of years ago. Said the same, I don't want to hear about Jesus. I don't want to hear about the church. So um, I don't talk to her that much about it. What I do is like a forward observer with a 105 millimeter howitzer thing, I pray. Lord, send in the missiles. Start to stir up the fallow ground. Pray. Your prayers are the most powerful weapon you can possibly use. All right? So you and I are advanced men and women for Jesus. Verse 2. The Lord said, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So the harvest is great, meaning there are many people who need salvation. Not that they even know it, or in this area, even want it. It's been estimated that maybe 10% of the folks in this area have any relationship with church or the Bible at all. 10%! You meet 10 people, one of them may have some interest in the Lord. But the Barna reports say nationally, including the South, you're fortunate to find 10% of the people who really know and love Jesus. 75% will say they're Christians. But maybe 10% really know the Lord. But the harvest is there. We need laborers. You and I need to go out into that harvest field. And by the way, when you pray, always be willing to be a part of the answer. Lord, send them out. Send Dudley and Helen out. While I sit back and get fat and eat kettle corn and, and uh, drink Pepsi and have a great time. Report back, guys, on what it's like. Don't ever pray about something unless you're willing to be a part of the solution on that. All right, go. He says, go your way, your way. Maybe a different way than somebody else's. Dudley, who's got a different ministry than I have, he, has a, he lives out in Steventown area. His way is different than mine. It's all about Jesus, but he's got a different pathway. And uh, he goes his way, I go mine. We're all to be doing the same thing, representing Jesus Christ. So go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves, 
oh, there are wolves out there. Wolves, what do wolves do? They eat you up, right? And so uh, we need to watch out. We're like lambs. I'd rather be a lion, wouldn't you? Strong, handsome, powerful. No, he says you're like a lamb. Gentle, meek, defenseless. They say that when a lamb falls into a ditch, the little guy won't even try to get up. He'll, str he'll struggle a couple of times, but if it's too deep, he'll just lay there and die. Talk about defenseless and dumb and weak. That's us. We need Jesus. Wisdom, Lord. Strength, Lord. So there are going to be wolves out there. Wolves out there, but not within the confines of this church, right? Wrong. There have been wolves in this church. In my family, there are no wolves. Oh, yes, there are. And I've got the teeth marks to show it. And so consequently, they'll be out there. We're not trying to point fingers because fingers always come back. Am I a wolf? I've given my heart to Jesus. I'm a lamb in that sense of the word. Perhaps I'm a wolf in some areas, though. Maybe I'm not exactly weak and submissive to the Lord. Maybe I'm still going my own way and being uh, aggressive in a wrong sense of the word. Lord, get all of the wolf out of me and let the Lamb of God come forth. All right, he says, carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. You're going for a short trip. You don't need to take a lot with you. Uh, all you do, like when you pack to take a trip, take what you need, but no more. Learn to trust the Lord to provide for your needs. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. If a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. So you walk in and you say, peace. What's the Hebrew word for it? Shalom. 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 Irene in the Greek, but shalom is still used today. It's a wonderful greeting. It means peace, and peace means health. Health to your body, your soul, your spirit, your finances, your relationships, peace. Shalom. They say that when they say hello, when they say goodbye. How about our word goodbye? That's not a bad phrase. You know what God goodbye really means? It's a contraction. Yeah, it's a contraction from the old English. God be with ye. Goodbye. It's a nice way to sign off. God be with you. And so uh, let the peace of God settle on that house. If they, like my sister, says, I don't want to hear about Jesus, take your peace back. And then you just shake the dust from your feet. Love you, sweetie. Love you, sister. Shake the dust off. Pray for her. But don't let it ruin your day. God still has another day for her and perhaps someone else who will be working on her. And he does. Her son married the most wonderful young lady who's born again, who has a mother who makes me seem like a backslider. And she is so much for the Lord and talks to my sister all the time about Jesus. And I just sit back and smile. And God's got other people out there to do the job as well. So you just pray for that as well. All right. Now, uh, when you go to some house... Don't look for a better deal. Verse 7, remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Don't go from house to house. You are deserving, when you're doing God's work, of having your needs met. Food, shelter. If you're in full-time ministry, certainly to hopefully have full-time uh, compensation for it. Um, and don't look for a better deal. I'm staying at Sadie's house, and she's got stale bread. But Rose across the street's got a nice fat stew there. So I think I'll leave her. No, just stay where you are. Let God provide for you. Uh, what's, what city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as they set before you. But it's payback time. You're not just there to sit around and eat their food and drink their beverage and sleep on their couch. You're there to work for the Lord, minister for the Lord. Look at verse 9. Heal the sick there. Heal the sick. That was for the 12. This is for the 70. That's for those in this room. That's for all believers. You and I are to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, Mark tells us. Heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. What does that mean? The kingdom and the king, Jesus, is here. How do I know? What's hurting in your body? Let's pray for it right now. Let's demonstrate the kingdom through the healing. God expects for you and for me to advertise and demonstrate the kingdom through physical healing. 
We should be out there healing to show that the kingdom of God has come near. Well, verse 10, whatever city you enter and they don't receive you, then go out into its streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you, it's going to be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Those were cities right near his area of Capernaum. If the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. It will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Tyre and Sidon were up a little bit north in Lebanon. And so uh, they haven't had me here, Jesus said. You've had me right here in your midst and you're not receiving me. To whom much is given, much is expected. And I am expecting that you're going to come to me. And he says, and you're not doing it. Verse 14, it's more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, that's because that was Jesus' headquarters. You are exalted to heaven. You'll be brought down to Hades, to the grave. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. He who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. So don't take it personally. I don't want to go out and share my faith because they might laugh at me. They might reject me. They might say no. My mother was a salesman. Her father was before her. And um, if they had that attitude, I don't want to go out and sell a product because they might not accept me. Well, they'd, they'd starve to death. Mother was selling Yellow Pages advertising uh, in the phone book, the R.H. Donnelly, <coughs> south of here in Sullivan County. Uh, she had two babies to feed, five and two. And uh, she couldn't say, well, they may reject me. And being a woman on the road back in the 1950s, she went to gas stations, bars, restaurants. They weren't used to seeing a woman. And uh, she got a lot of no's. She got a lot of yeses as well. She taught me, it's the numbers game. Any person in sales says, it's the numbers game. You'll get some no's. You'll get some yeses. You just hang in there. When you and I keep sharing the word, some will come to Christ. How did Noah do in his ministry? He was hammering away, building that ark for 120 years. He was preaching the gospel. How many came to Christ? How many came to God? Zero. Jeremiah, for, for decades, was preaching the gospel. How many did he win? None. But God still has a place for those men, a place of honor. Do your job. God will reward you for it. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting the Father. So they're obedient. Verse 17, they're going to go out now. And... Uh, they're going to witness, and oh, the Lord's going to rejoice with them. The 70 returned with joy, and they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. The demons are subject to us in your name. Jesus says in Mark 16, these signs will follow those who believe in my name. You will cast out demons, not your own name. In, in Jesus' name, you'll cast out demons. Any kind of demon? Oh, yeah. One day, one of our ladies had sent me a, a um, teaching, wanted to get my second opinion on this. And this person started talking about something that was so below my pay grade or whatever. I couldn't believe it here. That this whole teaching was that you are only entitled to have authority over demons in your own area. And if you try to go beyond your own metropolitan area, you're going to be beaten up by them. And the illustration would be like, I, I can take authority over demons in the Albany, Schenectady, and Troy area, but I had dare not go against the demons in Minnesota. Huh? I, I didn't know how to answer her nicely. <laughs> I felt like saying, you know, rubbish. But uh, I said, that, that to me is a new one. No, you're entitled to go after any demon in the name of Jesus. And I would get somebody else with you. Protect yourself. My mother used to say when you're going into a counseling session uh, in a, a real mental health kind of a situation or any kind of a situation, do your preparation. Do your protection work. Dudley, remember that? She said, do your protective work. Constantly pray. 
Plead the blood of Jesus over your life. Come in the name of Jesus. And then have an attitude like a mother does in a grocery store when the kid acts up. Oh, honey, you really ought not to be screaming and yelling like that. Or your father's going to, no, she doesn't say that. She says, knock it off. My mother used to say, shut up. And that's it. Mothers know how to exercise authority. That's the authority that you have. The demon knows you have the authority, but he wants to see if you know that you have the authority in Jesus' name. All right, you take that authority. Well, they, they had, and it worked out well. For verse 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Those are references to demon spirits. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Yes, I've given you the authority. It's in the name of Jesus. We saw last week you have the power and you have the authority. Dunamis, the power. Exousia, the authority. You've got both. The power and the right to use that power. Uh, you do it in Jesus' name and already he's been defeated. When did Satan fall like lightning from heaven? He fell like lightning from heaven, certainly at the cross. Paul says in Colossians that at the cross Jesus spoiled all the demon spirits right then, took away their power, took away their authority. And they're absolutely without that authority when you come in Jesus' name. We're going to see it also in the tribulation. You and I aren't going to be here. We'll be in heaven. But in the tribulation, you'll be cast out. In the midpoint of that tribulation, that power, right now you can trample on them in Jesus' name. Don't let any demon spirit make you think that that power is unavailable to you. But, as wonderful as that is to cast out demon spirits or take authority over the devil, more importantly, verse 20, rejoice in this, that your names are written in heaven. Amen. That your name is in the book of life. That you will be with Jesus Christ forever and ever. And let's always get back to that. That it's Jesus and his salvation. It's exciting to see people healed. It's wonderful to cast out demons. It's great to see God bless financially. But to be able to say that I am his and he is mine, that is worth everything right there. All right, so we have that power. We have the focus as we rejoice with him. Now he's going to talk about to verse 21. Uh, first, he says, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. He said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the, Father, the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son reveals him. He turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. So here we find that he's expressing his joy over their salvation. We know that when a person comes to Christ that the angels rejoice in heaven. How do you think Jesus feels? How do you think the Father feels, the Holy Spirit? Pure joy. Are we excited? Are we excited when someone comes to Christ? Yes. Absolutely, we should be. And then uh, he says in verse 21, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these wonderful truths of the kingdom from those who are worldly wise and worldly prudent. Those who in the world's eyes have great wisdom. Remember now, there's several kinds of wisdom. There's God's wisdom and then there's man's wisdom. Man's wisdom is not going to cut it. Man's wisdom says you can get to heaven on your own good works, on your own uh, policies and what have you. That's not going to cut it. So the wise, in the worldly sense, don't see what we're doing. That same sister I was talking about, and I do love her, has a higher IQ than I do, very bright, very, very bright. And she has heard some of my sermons on YouTube. And she says, Jill, that was my nickname when I was a kid. Jill, I have no idea what you're talking about. And uh, that is 
earthly wisdom, trying to understand godly wisdom. So pray for all of our relatives who don't know the Lord. Pray for us not to get bogged down in man's wisdom, earthly wisdom. But Lord, I want to always have the wisdom of God. There's all sorts of wisdom out there on the internet. There's an explosion of knowledge like we cannot believe. But, and of course, God does say at the end times there'll be that explosion of knowledge. But always have to discern the wisdom of God from the wisdom of man. Well, verse 30, 22, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son will reveal him. When you know Jesus, he'll show you the Father. Without that, you don't know the Father. I was very religious for a good part of my early life from age eight, I think it was, until age 26. Very religious and uh, studied the Bible every day. I thought I knew God, but I didn't. Used to listen to evangelists, Billy Graham and others, sit on, on the floor and do that altar call, tears running down my face. It said the sinner's prayer with him so many times, was never saved. How could that be? If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved? No. If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, Paul says, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. I had it up here. Didn't have it down here. Longest 18 inches in the world, from the head to the heart. <clears throat> so pray that people not only hear it, but that it's going to be in their hearts as well. Only Jesus can reveal the Father, and the Father reveal Jesus. Well, you and I should be grateful. Look at verse 23. Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. You see the work of Jesus. You see who he is and what he does. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. Samuel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, David, would have loved to see Jesus here on earth in the kingdom of God the way you and I can through our hearts. Now they see him in heaven, they're with him now, but they didn't see him here when they were here. Only the church from Acts chapter 2 on has had that privilege. Well, I'm grateful for it, but I pray for my neighbors that they're going to get to know Jesus, and then I pray for myself that I'm going to see more of you as well, Lord. My wife, the kids... May we all see more of you every day. Get up in the morning and say, Jesus, thank you that you've revealed yourself to me, and I ask that today you'll reveal yourself even more to me and help me to reveal you to someone else this day. Well, it all gets down to Jesus and his wisdom and his love. He's going to talk about love beginning in verse 25. He talks about uh, love as really caring for one another. That's such a key for marriage counseling. Dudley and Helen, as you guys have done your fair share of marriage counseling. I want to get a divorce. I don't love my husband anymore. I don't love my wife anymore. And um, I've grown out of love. Well, you've grown out of lust and you've grown out of the initial attraction and you've, got, you've grown out of the sense that that person can do more for me than I can do for them. And, and that initial excitement of it, that's worn off, sure, sure. Some have said that that kind of attraction can last six months. Not much more than that. But what is love? Love is caring. Love is serving. And that's always the struggle in marriage. It's the struggle in life. Uh, when I took care of my mother and father, and Dudley was our chief caregiver for dad, I get so frustrated. Uh, it was always about the same thing. It was about, yeah, I had to get up in the middle of the night and take care of dad when he wasn't, when Dudley wasn't there. He, was, he had the day shift, I had the night shift. But it was always the same thing. I was tired because I was feeling frustrated. I was receiving less than I was giving. And I was not seeing the joy and the love of, of serving. It wasn't all the time, but when I hit the, 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 the bottom of the meter, I'm married to the, one, the most wonderful gal in the world. My dad, who you cared for, never lied, did he? Except one time. He lied one time. 
And he did this again and again and again. He'd put his arms around my mother. He'd look at me and say, Jerry, and I was single then. He'd smile and say, I got the last good one. And I believed him. That's why I stayed single until I was 71 years of age. <laughs> the Lord said, wake up. <laughs> Dad lied on that occasion. <laughs> I got the last good one now. So that, that's it. But when I get frustrated at home, you know, the dishes are piling up in the sink. Kelly does her part. The kids not doing dishes. That's only in our house, right? And uh, not vacuuming and not caring to help out, etc., etc. Only in our house, right? And so you start to, to play that tape. And you start to get angry. You start to get frustrated. And I don't love that situation. Well, no, no. But how about serving? How about being a servant, being an example? And then if you're not able to ha handle that, how about doing it for Jesus and realizing you're doing it for him? And so uh, in any event, he says here that uh, you need to learn how to love. Get beyond yourself. He gives a very powerful example here, beginning in verse 25. We know it as the story of the Good Samaritan. That's a good definition of love right there. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, trying to entrap him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? See, he was a Jew, no doubt. He was a scribe. He was an expert in the law, the Bible. And uh, he uh, wanted to know on a works relationship, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Same question that they asked Jesus, as recorded by John, what do we do to have salvation? And Jesus said, what you do is you believe in the Son of God. That's what you do. You believe in me. But here the Lord's going to answer him. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You want to do that? There's something to do right there. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Loving God, loving your neighbor, always. That is a second way to heaven. You know there are two ways to heaven? One is to realize you're a sinner, to call upon Jesus to forgive you for your sins, and then to realize that he satisfied the law by his own life, and he also satisfied the law for you by taking your sins upon himself. That's plan A, which Christians take. Plan B, and the rest of the world's trying to do plan B, is to live a perfect, sinless life. Jesus did it. But the Bible says the rest of us are all sinners and come short of the glory of God. So if you ever sinned once in your life, if you were ever a baby nursing at mother's breast, and you were not just simply being a natural baby needing sustenance, but started to show a little attitude, boom, sin, lost salvation, that plan's gone. Now you need Jesus. And so he says here, if you want to do a works righteousness relationship, keeping the law, you keep it perfectly. You got to keep, love God and love your neighbor, and that's the summary of the law. He said to him, you have rightly answered, do this and you will live. So the, the uh, young fellow had the right answer. He knew the law. And Jesus said, fine, do that and you'll live. But that means never break it. James says you never break the law once or you've broken the whole law. You've broken it. But he wanted to justify himself. So he still was being a, a lawyer, right? He said to Jesus, who's my neighbor? He's, he's still challenging. Who's my neighbor? Who do I have to really love? And the Lord's going to give an answer. And the answer basically is anyone and everyone. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now this is a road that is so familiar to them. It's a journey, it's a 17-mile journey from Jerusalem, dropping over 3,000 feet in the altitude down to Jericho. It's got a lot of curving, winding turns to it. Easy for thieves to hide behind the corners and come out and steal your money and beat you up. And so here's this poor fellow. He's now left half dead. He's been robbed and almost dying. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. So here's the illustration. This is from the house of Aaron. This is a priest who serves in the temple. Doesn't get any higher or more religious or so-called righteous than that. So here's a certain priest. He comes down and he says, uh, 
He sees them, what's he do? He passes by on the other side. Don't want to get involved. Likewise, a Levite. A little bit less status, that's from the tribe of Levi. They also ministered in the temple, almost as high as a priest. So the, the Levite comes and he looks and he passes by on the other side. Don't want to get involved. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. The word compassion means from his innermost being. It ripped his guts out. That's what it really means in the Greek. It got him right in the core. And so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, that's two days' wages, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So there's the priest ministering in the temple before God. There are the Levites who keep the temple in order. They're not there. But here's a Samaritan. The Samaritans were hated by the Jews. They were considered to be half-breeds. So much animosity that James and John had wanted to bring down fire from heaven because the Samaritans simply looked the other way when Jesus passed by. They didn't talk to each other. But here's a Samaritan. And he's there to minister to the person's needs. So who's my neighbor? Anyone who has a need. Anyone who has a need. We like to think that we are, are there. The other day, my wife showed me without meaning to that I wasn't there. The doorbell rang when she and I were in the office working and uh, this couple came and they were obviously uh, rather homeless looking and uh, whatever that means and uh, in need. And I looked back over the 40 years experience and said, I'll probably see them five more times between now and Christmas. And uh, we don't really have the money. And she said, uh, so I said, thanks so much for stopping by. Sorry to say that. So she said, that's not right. So she pushed me aside, reached into her own pocket and gave enough to take care of their needs. So I said, uh, I guess that was the right thing to do, honey. That's, that's being the good Samaritan. So none of us are always there. Sometimes I'm a priest, sometimes I'm a Levite. Lord, I want to be a Samaritan. I want to always be there to meet that need. Now, you need wisdom sometimes, because frankly, there are people who know that you're supposed to be a Samaritan, and they're very happy to receive when they don't need to. Receive when they don't feel like going out and working, etc. But um, the Bible, Proverbs does say, if a person has a need, you meet that need. You let the Lord sift it and sort it all out about how he's going to straighten them up and get them flying right. But go and do likewise. Lord, help me to be a Samaritan today. Help me to show Jesus to somebody. That Samaritan showed Jesus, not the priest, not the Levite. That's what love really is. Well, now we're going to see about loving God. And uh, you want to see somebody who really loves God? I can't wait to meet her in heaven. That's Mary, not the mother of Jesus, who certainly loved God. But this is Mary, the sister of Martha and of Lazarus. Now it happened as they went, verse 38, he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, uh, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. So where is Mary? Look at verse 39. She's sitting at Jesus' feet. Later on, when Lazarus is dead, the Lord's going to come after four days, and uh, where will Mary be? 
on that occasion. She'll do what? She'll fall down on her, at his feet again. And then at the uh, last week of his life, she's going to come into the banquet where he is and she's going to anoint his feet with oil. She'll be at his feet again. That doesn't mean that she didn't clean the house. <laughs> we understand Martha. We understand Martha. We've got a lot of people around that don't want to clean the house, but we need to be able to do that. But we need to respect each other's calling. I've mentioned this so many times, but uh, uh, years ago when I first got saved, I used to be one of these <coughs> guys that got up about 5 o'clock in the morning, 5.30, get on my knees, pray for an hour, laid my hands on a globe that I would light up and pray over the world. That lasted for a couple of years and I got tired, my knees got tired. And I said, Lord, I can't do this. I'm a multitasker. I just can't get on my knees. I'm going to fall asleep. I need a plan. So he brought a plan into my life. A beautiful lost homeless dog named Sandy and I walked her and I found that I could walk and pray. And that was better for me than just kneeling and sitting. So that was my particular answer. And I've been walking dogs ever since and praying ever since. But I married a gal that follows that pattern of getting up in the morning and getting her a cup of coffee and sitting in her prayer chair for one hour. Even when she was traveling over to Massachusetts and had an hour and a half trip, getting up a little earlier, sitting in there for that hour. And Kelly does that. She sits in that chair and she reads Psalm 91 and then begins to pray over this one and that one, members of the church, family, the country, um, and worships the Lord and sings and then she's ready to go. What am I doing? Cleaning the litter box, walking the dogs, getting this and that done. And so I'm busy doing my thing, but praying as I'm going along. And I've learned to respect, it didn't take any time at all, I respect and honor that time she has as she is giving undevoted, or just undivided attention to the Lord. But I'm doing my thing by praying as I go. It's just a different style. Important thing is you're both connected. But uh, Martha's got the wrong attitude here. Now, I think Martha loves Jesus, don't you? Yeah. I think there were times when she sat at his feet, perhaps, but on this occasion, she's doing dishes or doing something, and uh, Mary's not helping her. So we find that Martha is judging Mary, judging her that she's being critical of her, that she's not helping her, judging her that <clears throat> Mary's uh, time is not being well spent. I could say... Kelly, if you wouldn't sit in that chair and pray and read the Bible, then I could do the litter boxes in the basement and you could do them on the top floor and I could be done twice as fast if you would do that. But that would be wrong. That would be judging and that would be depriving her of what she needs to sit at Jesus' feet for that time. And so we need to be careful about this. Yeah, we need to get the house cleaned. There's a time for that. But don't judge somebody else who has a different walk with the Lord. Don't judge the one who sits at Jesus' feet. Don't judge the one who is walking the dog instead of sitting at the feet. Find your own pattern, what's right for you, and then you do it. And then if somebody's pattern is different than yours, don't judge it. I, I used to read these, uh, these books written by people who meant well. No, this is how you should pray. And this is how you should... No, forget all that stuff. Ask Jesus how you should pray. Ask him how to order your day. Ask him how to minister. Ask him how to diet. Ask him how to dress. Ask him how to serve. Ask him about everything with your life, and then you'll be fine. Somebody else has a different plan, great. Don't judge it. That's different strokes for different folks. But you do what the Lord tells you to do. But Mary, she's very special. And I do think that last time she's at his feet when she's anointing with oil, she's anointing for burial while the disciples are busy arguing over who's going to be the best in the kingdom. That time that she had with Jesus made her particularly attuned to the Lord as nobody else we see in Scripture. Amen. Mary was very special. In order to really get to know somebody, you've got to spend time with that person. Mary spent time with Jesus. And I'll say this about Kelly. She spends a lot of time with the Lord. And it's not just that hour in the morning. It's throughout the day. And then at night, she's doing the same thing. And so she's pretty much always uh, ready to go. 
the engine is always revved up and she's always ready to pray. And texts are coming in until 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. And she's texting and emailing prayers and stuff like that. Open for business. And so it's just great to see that. And uh, if I'm not quite in that mood or that mode, I can grab a dish and clean it and let her continue to minister. Or I can do the litter box or what have you. Lord, help me not to judge. Help me to be available to do what I can do. And there are those that can pray for an hour or two and those that you can't. Don't, don't be envious of that. Just do what you can do. That's all the Lord says. Do what you can do. And don't judge somebody else who does something different. Okay? It's all about wisdom. Lord, it all comes down to those two words. And I want to thank Gary Tash if he ever listens to this. Gary Tash is our premier sound man in this area. Has set up most of the sound systems for most of the churches. One day he was kneeling in the back there. My secretary and I were watching him and he was trying to get something, some wires going and it was not quite there. He stopped and he said, wisdom, Lord. Paused, his hands put it together, connection, and that was it. Never forgot that. Never forgot that. Wisdom, Lord. It always works. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. Oh, there's so many decisions to make, so many things we're confused about in our own lives, in the lives of family and friends and our nation and the world. Lord, we can't figure it all out. Nobody can, but you can. And so, Lord, help us to just keep it simple. Wisdom, Jesus. Show us what to do. Show us how to uh, live a life that glorifies you and how to share that with other people. It's all about you, Lord, living life skillfully, which means living life in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen, amen. and amen.